milligrams is an effective dose. So this, this patient had gotten hundreds of milligrams with no effect. So by adding this alpha ethyl to the side, replacing the methyl of the amphetamine with this ethyl, you completely kill its activity. So we made a compound called MBDB, which is MDMA, but it's got an alpha ethyl instead of an alpha methyl. And the compound, although it's not identical to MDMA in humans, the psychopharmacology, has properties that are close enough you can say, you know, this is the same kind of effect. And so I thought, <clears throat> politically, you know, what, what are you going to call these things? They have to, if it's a new class of something, if it's a new class of psychoactive drug that does something different than a hallucinogen, what are you going to call it? So I, I thought for a long time, uh, well, you know, what is it? What does it do? And really, I thought, you know, what does it do? It, it, go, it opens up your inside. It gets inside somehow. It produces this effect of getting inside and bringing out, you know, repressed memories and so forth. And so I put together this word intactogen, which basically is a combination of roots from Greek, uh, an and gen, and tactus, which is a, a Latin root, which means basically producing a touching within. And I thought, okay, now we've got a name for it. It was really, a, it was, a, it was pharmaco pharmacology motivated, but also politically motivated, because I thought, you know, if you're going to talk about a new class of drug, it has to have some name. You can't just say, well, it's a sort of an amphetamine, or it's a, like a mixture of a hallucinogen and an amphetamine, or whatever. So no, it's an intactogen. Now, in this country, Ralph Metzner, I believe, coined the term empathogen, because it produces empathy. Well, empathy is what you feel for someone else. And I thought, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And then when I talked about empathogen, the pathogen seemed, a lot of people said, pathogen, that sounds bad. So pathogen is like bacteria and pathogens. So I said, yeah, I kind of don't like it either. So we had actually the empathogen and tactogen debate, I think it was called, and on the MAPS website, I think there's even an argument that I put up, and Metzner argued for empathogen, and I argued for intactogen. Uh, and scientifically, empathogen sounds kind of too loosey-goosey, too. If you're going to talk about actually medical use, intactogen, maybe that's better. In Europe, intactogen is the preferred term. If you see work with these in Europe, any place in Europe, Switzerland, Germany, et cetera, they refer to them as intactogens. So that's sort of the genesis of the term. It was once we had proven by the fact that MDMA had a methyl, which wasn't tolerated in psychedelics. MDMA, uh, the plus isomer was more active, which was opposite to what you saw in psychedelics. And then you could take the alpha methyl in the side chain and turn it to an alpha ethyl, and that absolutely killed activity, and yet it was still active in MBDB. That basically was a proof, a scientific proof, and no one's rebutted that, that this class of drugs are not just, they're not hallucinogenic amphetamines. They do something else. And we know now they're releasers of stored transmitters primarily as their mechanisms of action. And very, very messy, pharmacologically messy. So naively in the beginning, I thought, well, let's come up with a new drug that will do what MDMA does, but which didn't come from the illicit drug market, so to speak. And then maybe we could actually develop it as a drug and get away from the whole notoriety that accompanies something that had its genesis in the, on the street scene. But unfortunately, that turns out to be an extremely difficult, if not impossible, thing to do because MDMA does a number of different things that are important. Everyone talks about it releasing serotonin, but it also releases dopamine, and it also releases norepinephrine. And virtually no one has studied the, uh, its ability to release norepinephrine. There's one or two studies. We did one. And dopamine is sort of the thing that makes you feel good. Serotonin, if you have a pure serotonin releaser, you don't feel good at all. You feel kind of really blah, and you lose your appetite, and you feel lethargic. And So MDMA isn't just releasing serotonin. These other components are important. But it also stimulates a couple of other different types of receptors. So what you get is this complex interplay of pharmacological effects that leads to this drug MDMA, which is it has its sort of own personality, you might say. And the ability to find another substance that works exactly that that same way, it's just there's just no way to do it because we don't know which of the components of MDMA are really the most important. We don't know what the proper balance is that they have to have and what other the ancillary receptors are that have to be activated. So when we started developing, trying to develop drugs, it turns out that we got some very good serotonin releasing agents, very specific, very powerful serotonin releasing agents but they lost the dopamine and norepinephrine effects and really didn't have MDMA-like effects at all. And so what you really had was a problem of a number of targets, multiple targets that you had to hit in a certain optimal ratio. And we didn't know what those targets were to begin with other than just serotonin release. But when you make a change that affects one of those, it affects all the others too. So it's, 
it's kind of an optimization process where you're trying to optimize an unknown number of different factors at the same time. But I think it's an absent someone discovering something just serendipitously that's like MDMA. I think uh, scientifically it's almost an impossibility to craft something that would have the same pharmacology of MDMA. Talk about your son Charles' work and blocking the immune chain. Oh, that's really a fascinating story. That's really a fascinating story. He started at LSU. He, you know, his PhD is in Drosophila genetics, so he's a hardcore molecular biologist. Uh, he can knock genes in and knock genes out and had expertise with Drosophila and did a postdoc with a woman named Elaine Sanders Bush at Vanderbilt, who is one of the other LSD researchers, serotonin researchers. Did a postdoc and then was a research assistant professor there and taught her group how to do molecular biology and got involved in rats, et cetera. And <clears throat> after he finished all of his training, got a job at LSU in New Orleans in the pharmacology department. And he wanted to continue to study serotonin. No one had really studied the serotonin system in fruit flies. And I can't remember the percentage of genes in fruit flies that are the same as the genes in humans, but it's like 70 some percent. And we're not that different from fruit flies, actually, in a genetic basis. So he thought there would be translational things he could find. And a lot of things have been found in fruit flies, uh, proteins that turn out to be important for Parkinson's disease and, and leukemias and different kinds of things were first discovered in Drosophila. And then they went to the human genome and looked to see, well, like, what does this do in humans? And they find out, oh, this is a really important thing. So he thought he would do a translational type research project where he worked with Drosophila, looked for corresponding genes in rats and humans, and could make these connections. And after he got there, he wanted to work on the serotonin system in flies to map it out first. And he didn't have a Schedule One license. And of course, you can't work with LSD and, and psychedelics if you don't have a Schedule One license. So he applied for it. It took a long time to get it. But he wanted to start his work. He said, is there anything that works like these psychedelics that's not a controlled substance? I said, well, there's this amphetamine called DOI that everybody uses it as the prototypic um, phenethylamine psychedelic. It's not popular on the street, I think, because it's so long-acting, and I don't know if it you know, has any advantage over anything. So, so you don't see it on the street that much. So it hadn't been scheduled. Now, in the process, the DEA is in the process of trying to schedule it now. It may even be scheduled. But then it was the only one. I said, that's the only one I know of, and it's sort of the prototype. And he was, didn't have any grants. He said, you know, could you send me some? So I sent him a sample and sent him the isomers. We'd made the isomers and sent him the two isomers. And as a result of Katrina blowing in there, a lot of labs were shut down and people left. And there was a guy over, they have, had a cardiovascular center, and there was a guy over there that had a postdoctoral fellow, and he left. And the postdoctoral fellow didn't want to leave. His wife was pregnant and didn't want to leave, leave New Orleans, and so he looked around to see who was available. He saw my son Charles was over there doing research, kind of interested in him, and he went over and talked to him. And, and Chuck was looking for a postdoc and hadn't been able to find one. This guy was well trained. He had an MD degree from China, but had a lot of experience with cardiovascular pharmacology. So he started working for him. And then, if I understand the story correctly, they had been working with these uh, smooth muscle cells from rat aorta and as a model for inflammation. And they had some of these cells already growing. And this guy, his postdoc, Bing Ming, I think Bing Ming, Bing Min is his name. And he asked Chuck, he said, well, what would happen if we put this DOI in these cells? And Chuck kind of chuckled and said, well, I'm, I'm probably nothing. But the guy said, well, we've got the cells. You know, it would be interesting to see. And they have a model where they put in something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. And this substance is, um, can produce a lot of pain and inflammation. Some of the new biologics for people that have arthritis, uh, Anbril and things like that, they block TNF-alpha receptors, and, and it stops the pain. So it's a, it's a critical molecule. I think it's transcription factor. And so they put this TNF-alpha in these cells, and it would induce a whole bunch of other enzymes and factors that are part of the inflammation cascade and process. So they put this TNF-alpha in these cells and started the assay, and they added DOI. And they did a dose response for different concentrations of DOI. And after the experiment was done, this postdoc came in and told him, told my son, said, you know, this stuff blocks the effects of TNF alpha completely. And the concentration where it does it is 20 picomolar, 20 times 10 to the minus 12th molar. It's, there's no drug that works at that concentration. That's more potent than LSD. So my son Charles says, no, that can't be. You must have made a mistake. So he went in and repeated the assay himself and completely blocked the effect at that concentration, 20 picomolar. So 
he had confirmed it. So then they started doing some study studies. They showed that it was that it was working through the serotonin 2A receptor, and this is the same target for psychedelics. Um, and you can completely block it. And not only that, if you put in TNF alpha, you can wait as long as four hours later and put in the DUI, and it still blocks it. So he's actually, uh, I think, got a grant to st study that further, and they're looking at the development of uh, asthma and atherosclerosis, et cetera. But he's looked at a couple other drugs now that he has a Schedule One license, things like LSD, for example. LSD does it, but it's one, you know, like one thousandth the potency, potency of DUI. So there's something interesting about DUI that it does it. But it's kind of interesting because it, it makes me think about all these people that took psychedelics and, you know, there's a story of a woman that was allergic to cats and she was taking LSD and the cat jumped on her lap and she thought, oh, no, you know. That's Andrew Wheel, actually. Is it? Yeah. So, okay, so I, I guess I heard that at the San Jose. So, you know, and then it was all, and the allergy's gone. I'm thinking, well, now, you know, there's this romantic notion that it's this mind over matter LSD thing, but maybe you just have an inflammatory cascade set up with this allergen, and so you take a psychedelic and it breaks this, shuts down some uh, gene expression. So it may well be that, you know, we joke about people maybe going around, if you get heart atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic heart disease, maybe, you know, someday people will be taking very low sub hallucinogenic doses of these psychedelics to, to block progression of the disease. But I think it's a very interesting uh, discovery. A lot of people are really uh, really excited about it. He had that paper that he published in Journal of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. Uh, he had a review of that in uh, another high-profile journal saying, you know, this is really amazing. There's nothing that works quite like this. So it will be interesting to see further developments in the field. I know he's looking at some other models of inflammation, asthma, things like that, to see exactly how powerful this effect is. But it's one of those things that was completely unexpected. Where, where in the world would you ever have the uh, connection between a psychedelic and, you know, an inflammatory response in these rat cells other than, you know, the postdoc came from this other lab, he knew how to do it, there were some cells there, Chuck didn't have the Schedule One license, but he had the DOI, well, let's put it in, instead of just wasting the cells, let's run the assay, see what happens, and, you know, what a bizarre series of circumstances. So, I think there's something important there, and I look forward to seeing more work from his lab in the next couple of years, but to see whether this really pans out. Now, what about the recent effects of LSD on the on the genes that I heard you mention recently? Now, is that something that people can take and say, see, we've been saying that LSD can affect your genes or your DNA for, for years. What's the potential for that to be picked up by the media and used the wrong way? Yeah, it, it doesn't change your genes. It changes gene expression. In most cases, we assume that's probably reversible, but in some cases, in, in people, for example, have a latent psychosis, and LSD trips the psychosis, they probably had uh, a genes in there that made them predisposed to that to begin with. What he basically did was give LSD to rats, sacrificed them an hour later, and looked to see what gene expression changes occurred. So what genes were turned on to produce different proteins, and is that could that be related to the psychedelic effect? So it's it's a it's farther so you have a you have the psychedelic interact with the brain receptor. The brain receptor triggers biochemical changes in the cell. Most people just look at those immediate biochemical changes and what he was saying is are there any long term expression changes that we can see? And so he was looking at that. Now what's happened is where we've had rats we've chronically treated with LSD for a long time, we see many more changes in those genes. And those genes, genes are related to neuroplasticity and neural growth and, and things that are related to really brain health. So his idea was to use LSD as a drug which profoundly affects behavior in humans to see what kinds of gene expression changes occur and then go into people with certain types of mental illness, 